Are we on the air? We're on the air. Welcome to Gender Class. We were just having fun uh, waiting for you as we see Kim coming down the hall. Yay! Um, anyway, uh, we're having our Gender Class today and we've got uh, a test next class. I have no idea what that means for you people watching TV or taking it on TV course, uh, ITV. But, oh, I think it means you come to campus. Isn't that what that means? means you come to campus, of course, and you'll see me or a grader uh, next class. And uh, we reviewed over it last class, uh, but we're going to cover uh, a couple of questions I haven't given you um, and then uh, talk about what I think is some of the most fascinating stuff of understanding gender that is possible. Um, hello to Sean and Amy. It's, it's like we've, we've, I've already said hi to them. Let's see. We're kind of playing <laughs> like we haven't done that. I'm taking, this far, I'm taking this far too seriously, aren't I? <laughs> Pretty soon I'll have my top ten list, you know, or whatever. But I do want to say hi to uh, two friends and perennial students, Phyllis and Shannon, who said they're going to take this course over and over. And uh, cool. Uh, I'm sure I'll hear about that. But anyway, welcome to the class. Um, where are we? Gender. And one of the things I've been doing, put here on three, please, camera three. We've looked at male, female. You know, you heard about the two babies that were born in the hospital, and I think it was uh, someone who didn't speak English, and they had twins, and somebody asked, well, what did you name them? And one was Molly, the other was C. Molly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Isn't that kind of funny, Shauna, Amy? <laughs> That's no. My daughter was saying, Dad, you're being so queer and stupid. Just get on with it. Okay, uh, and then we've been looking at male and female, determined to a large degree by our, to, uh, our uh, genetic components. And uh, then we looked at masculine and feminine as archetypal energies that... Uh, Men, men and women uh, to have uh, equal rights, equal expressions of their own uniqueness as persons, but it uh, doesn't mean that they're just the same uh, genetically or uh, archetypally. We see these energies, these masculine feminine energies, and we looked at that for several classes. And we, we kind of, and we said that men and women both have masculine and feminine, although ma men tend to be closer to the masculine, women tend to be closer to the feminine. Not all men, not all women. In fact, what we'll look at today, we'll find that there are some women who seem to have more masculine archetypal energy and some uh, men that it seems to have more feminine archetypal energy but are clearly men or clearly women. I was thinking uh, coming over here like uh, Barishnikov, the dancer. Now see, there's a, a dancer would be a, a man who, uh, a male dancer would be a man who's taken grace and beauty and you know music and art and which we might say is more soulful components of life and his uh, uh, use that to honor the feminine energies uh, any poets and writers and uh, you know therapists uh, teachers in the men who take on more feminine soulful compassionate things of life of course, our culture, we, we've talked about too, you know, pays a lot of money to warrior energy and the seeker and the competitive side. It doesn't pay much money to people who are interested in uh, art, soul, meaning, purpose, you know, the fullness of the human experience. And so that tells you a whole lot as, as what we looked at is uh, Jung was saying that the wound in Western civilization is the lack of feminine energy. We've lost it. We're more concerned about where we're going and what we're getting than really who we are and how we're living. And um, so what's, what's interesting in looking at this is these very things that are going on in our inner lives actually have effect on our whole culture. So, and today what we're going to look at is we're going to look at anima and animus. And remember, anima is the Latin word for soul which we'd say anima is what side of the male psyche? 
The feminine side, yeah. I think you'll like a lot of this stuff. And then animus is spirit. And that would be the masculine side of the woman's psyche. Um, and again, these things are hard to uh, do double-blind studies with, and they, uh, but, but the literature and uh, history and art and uh, story is clear about this. In fact, uh, where was I the other day? I was at some store, I was someplace, and I stepped up and somebody handed this jar to this woman and she couldn't open it and immediately she handed it to me. I said, wait, I teach gender. Why are you picking on me? Can't you open that? But it, she says, no, you were the closest male. And I went, that's very interesting. I'm going to talk about you in my class, but see, since I can't remember who it was, I can't really um, kid about it. But the point of it is, is she just immediately, hey, you know, where's some man that, to open this? And what was she assuming? Push the button and say that. Men are stronger. Yeah, men are stronger. And, and that, that is biologically, yes, but specifically, no. There's some women that are much stronger than men. Uh, but I, I had one of those, gotcha, see? This gender stuff is very fascinating, going on all the time. And where we get in trouble with it is when we make stereotypes out of gender differences uh, and don't allow people to have the total archetypal spectrum of being fully human, fully alive. Okay, so, um, so that's where we're going to the, to the test. We're going to look at that. So today I want to talk about this anima and animus. Ominous. <laughs> Did you see that? Nobody caught that. Letting good old Dr. Agan die in a pile. That's very interesting. Anonymous. The so students from other classes, often I misspell things and they'll just leave it and they'll come up at the end and I'll go, so that's where everybody was snickering. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, and I actually did this last, our last class, <laughs> which is probably very confusing to some people who are waking up at four in the morning and trying to go back to sleep, this will put you to sleep, believe me. Um, we're looking at two people here, and you, shown as sort of these icebergs, uh, in the sense that what we're aware of is above the water. See, at the very top, we might have, as it were, the whole human race that has ever existed and lived. You know, we. We move into this conscious experience, but we have all these archetypal energies, these this soulfulness, these aspects of the human experience. And different ones of us have manifested different archetypal energies. And remember, we looked at, in terms of masculine, we looked at warrior and seeker as uh, from Carol Pearson's work as predominantly archetypes of masculine energy. And we looked at, what did we look at for... Feminine, we looked at lover and caregiver. And one of the things we're seeing in our culture uh, is women finding more warrior energy, not just now, but it's been going on for decades, and finding their seeker energy, and men finding caregiver and nurturer energy. Um, so we see a great shift in these stereotypes, and uh, it's wonderful to be a part of it. The, the fact what will happen is in marital relationships, often when people fall in love, they ha they're fixed in certain uh, archetypal energies. One may be more assertive and one more passive. A couple that stays together 10, 20 years, 30 years, this even happens if you get older, whether you remarry or whatever. Actually, the one who was more active actually becomes more passive, and the one who's more passive becomes maybe more assertive. Because what happens is over time, these archetype energies begin to emerge. You may have seen it with your parents, you know, how the typical thing would be, and again, these are stereotypes, father working in the yard, mother doing the house, as it were. And I know only 7% of the families in America does the man bring the money and the woman stays home. But theoretically, let's say she cooks, and then at somewhere at midlife, you begin to see the man doing more cooking and things around the house. So what happens is his caregiver energy, his archetype has begun to emerge. And then the woman might move out and go do some things, whereas before she'd been more caretaking. So these uh, archetypes are in us all the time. They're always looking for manifestations of, of uh, 
for a, a place to manifest themselves, and they always will. And what we don't uh, consciously develop and own, what do we do? We project out into other people. And uh, it's the classic thing that the woman who doesn't have her warrior energy developed will marry a man who has great warrior energy. And a man who's not in touch with his feelings, his tenderness, his, uh, his emotional world, will often marry a woman who's very emotional. It's like, honey, I'll do the thinking, you do the crying. See? And when that goes on for a long time, marriage is split up because, it, but because people have split psyches. It's just a matter of time before she has to engage more of her thinking and warrior energy, and he has to get in touch with his vulnerability, limitation, pain, uh, insecurity of just being a human being. Okay, so what I've did here in our uh, little chart here, as we look at this woman, consciously feminine, but her unconscious, this masculine onimus side, her inner, uh, the inner world, this uh, onimus uh, is often in the unconscious. And because remember, the goal of the first half of life is to become your gender. And we all do that based on what the world's around us, and that's unique for everyone. And for this male, in what's what he has to come to integrate is his soul or his anima, his feminine side, his feelings. And we're going to look at what all of this is in today's class. And um, before I start, let me just say something that is... Uh, uh, we were talking a little bit before class. This, all, this stuff is all kind of heavy in the sense that this stuff really begins to make sense as we live two, three, four, or five decades of life because we begin to see these unconscious, archetypal, autonomous energies, the anima and animus. They're autonomous and they're unconscious. Uh, and and uh, Carl Jung said, this is the masterpiece of the psychic journey, is integrating these aspects. And there's a lot to do before that. Get in touch with our ego, find the roles that we play, our egocentric ways to get love and TLC and, and uh, food, clothing, shelter. What are our shadows? What are our problems? What is the baggage we bring to the world that we ask other people to carry? And doing shadow work, getting in touch with our mask, our persona. This, and so many of us identify with it. Hello, I'm a professor, so I'll always be a professor. Wherever I go, I play professor. Well, I'm a person who happens to be a professor, and I'm a psychologist, I'm, I'm a father, I'm a lot of things, dancer. I do a lot of things. But if we identify with one role of our persona, we're really skating on thin ice because we're so much more than our role. But part, a lot of life is getting in touch with those things. And, uh, and the conflicts that we have, whether personal, relational, or uh, socially, a uh, larger society, are often because this growth is happening within us. So if this stuff, if some of this doesn't make sense, or you say, gosh, that's just too deep, just I want to expose you to it. And I find that most college students really like this stuff a lot because they're already experiencing it. And you'll actually see a lot of these traits in your parents and other people around and in yourself. So um, let's look at this. So let's look, first of all, at the anima. And the anima is the, uh, means soul in Latin which is the, uh, in the man's experience of the feminine, a man's experience of the feminine. And uh, Jung said the anima is really the archetype of life itself. M much of this material that I'm giving you today comes from a, a woman named um, Jean Rafa who is uh, uh, a woman I, who, who I've heard in several seminars and read some of her books. She's a psychologist out of uh, Florida and uh, does a lot of this work. But um, what, what's interesting, uh, she's written and others have written too, is women tend to be closer to their soul, their, their in interior world, their feeling function, perhaps due to the uh, menstruation cycle where a woman realizes Every 28 days, she just has to submit to something she cannot control. 
and her body goes through these changes and it's a really sacred experience because it means the procreation evolutionary chain of new life uh, potentially can happen through her but a woman has to learn to just as it were suffer through and find meaning greater than what she's experiencing uh, often I think men who are unconscious of the inner world really get in touch with their inner world when they probably get sick for the first time. I mean like ill, really sick. Like when a teenager or a man in his twenties or something is put down for a couple of weeks with a bad disease or flu and suddenly they realize they can't control everything. And Amy is so glad that Michelle shows up because Michelle has her notes yeah. for the test. <laughs> I know. I was counting on you. So, anyway, little little personal house cleaning. You don't mind, do you, Shauna and Amy? We're, we're, we'll, we'll invite you to the uh, Christmas party. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So, the anima is really the archetype of life itself. It's a man's uh, ex experience of his body, his body, his instincts and his feelings. It's his, and the anima really represents a man's capacity for relationship. Capacity for relationship. And communication. And it, it, the anima also, repre anima also represents a man's uh, uh, co his, uh, connection to his spirituality, what gives him meaning to spirituality uh, and to Mother Nature. I was uh, privileged to be born in a family in Corpus Christi where we had, uh, my father was avid fisherman and uh, fisher person, and uh, my, mo uh, my mom fished too. And we'd go down Padre Island uh, in the 50s, I guess, and spend two weeks on the beach, go 70 miles down. Unbelievable experiences fishing down there. And everything you ate tasted like sand. Uh, but we had a 12,000-acre uh, hunting lease back when middle-class families could afford it, down by Freer for 15 years or so. And so I was fortunate to be exposed to Mother Nature like that. And what a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of men that go hunting and fishing, it's not just the warrior kill, kill instinct, uh, but a lot of that is men's spirituality. Getting out on a lake, getting out on a boat. And, and many women know this too, but a lot of, uh, I encourage a lot of uh, spouses to, women, wives, to encourage their husbands that, you know, he needs to get out and go connect with his soul because Mother Nature has a way of touching us within. And we see a lot of that, uh, men getting out and, um, connecting. I mean, we get obsessed with it. If you watch the fishing and hunting, all these stories on TV, and I'm one who'll spend a Saturday afternoon watching a fishing, you know, deal on TV. I love that stuff. But anyway, that's a man connecting to his anima. It connects us to his soul. There's something very powerful that gets him away from his competition and trying to prove something, although obviously men are very competitive. We, you know, we hold up the big fish and we're saying, see, I'm, I'm really worthy of something. I went to the unconscious, the unknown, and I lured this from the deep. Aren't I worth something? Yes, you are. Now you can be a part of the tribe. See? So the racks of animals and pictures of animals and fish and stuff are often a way uh, that we uh, young boys are initiated into the male tribe, the, the uh, adult world. So, uh, so what we do not connect with, and the anima is a man's capacity of relationship and to beauty, art, uh, meaning, which is spirituality, too. And to the degree that a, a man doesn't connect with his soulful beauty, art, meaning, purpose, animation of his life, what will he do? Push the button somebody and say project it out project, project it out. out very good nice train need some M&Ms to throw out there now yeah we project all we do not consciously experience of our inner life onto the other and if a man hasn't found his own beauty and his own wonder his own mystery if he hasn't found his own uh, uh, 
can to get in touch with his own feeling world. That's what keeps him from just being a, a machine. Then he will project it out on someone else, and and often confuse. Uh, and and we looked uh, from we is often this is what romantic love is all about. If anybody's read it, you understand what I'm talking about, because there's a question on that. What is romantic love? And uh, it, it's that profound connectedness, new energy, hope. This some sort of homecoming we get when we fall in love with someone, and we have because something in our own world is integrated as a result of projecting onto another person, and as uh, as uh, Johnson says in the book, the whole culture, our spirituality is about romantic love. Keep that high, keep that buzz, keep that feel good, and then, of course, half the marriages fail. Well, gosh, if it felt so good, why did it fail? Fail, <laughs> fail. Uh, and possibly it failed, as he says, because there wasn't much human love, which has to do with friendship, understanding, tolerance, loving a person, and not just sort of using a person to get that spiritual high and meaning that we all need, but we have to find it uh, from something greater than our ego that lies within us, like having a cause or a faith or a purpose greater than your ego. So I, I always think uh, it's romantic love is always reminding us that there's so much more passion in our soul that wants to connect with life and live fully. Uh, the problem is, is we, we attach it to someone of the opposite sex, and then we demand that person still give us that stimulation. They may awaken what's in there, and that's wonderful, but the goal is to feed what's in there and not ask another person to be that for us. Um, although... You know, you wouldn't want to marry somebody that didn't give you that buzz and rush and that animation of life. But uh, to depend on it totally. Uh, pe people fall in love and break up, or people fall in love, stay together, raise kids, go through years together, and they never become friends. You know, they never know how to just connect as people. Uh, so uh, moving on with the anima. So this is the internal feminine side of life, the arch archetype of life itself a man's source of his animation. And it's uh, also the principle of eros. This is um, just some of this, of which is connectedness. We, we see this in the business world on any given day, about 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock or maybe the day before, a week before. Men are calling up and courting each other. Hey, Bob, can I buy you lunch? Hello, sounds like a date to me. Uh, we do this all the time, and it's that connectedness and relatedness. And at lunch, while people are smoozing and chatting and talking stories, what are they doing? They're bartering, trading, all around the, the, the soul connectedness. But if you ever talk to men about that, they'd say, hey, don't give me that kind of stuff. I'd say, well, who bought the last meal you had? Well, this guy. Sounds like a date to me. See? We court one another that way. Well, there's a lot to teach here. Let me, I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, so when it, when a man is is connected to his anima uh, in a positive way, she serves him well. Let me uh, look at the handout I gave you. The anima animus fight. Do y'all have this right there? You have it in your handout. You should. Amy, do y'all have that? Uh, Shauna. We're searching for it. I think that's the handout we didn't get. Ooh. Oh. I oh, thought... yeah. That day we were supposed to get uh, two of them, and um, only one was sent. Oh, okay. Well, I will... Um, I don't know what I'll do. Um, I thought she... I, anyway, the secretary at, at, the, at the department said she sent it today, uh, or yesterday. But maybe it didn't get through. Well, do y'all have it here? Does anybody not have it? You don't? Know? You can come get this one if you need it. And uh, I'll get one to you. It, it, this, this isn't essential at all for the test, although it will help us out. Um, up here on page 41 at the top, and the students taking it on TV, you, you obviously have this, or you can get it on the web where my all these things are. Uh, download it. It says, likewise, the anima, 
in her negative manifestations. Now, see, if it positively, if a man is rightly related to it, he has a capacity for relatedness, spirituality, connectedness, beauty, art, meaning, his feelings. He can share and relate and without being defensive. Now, in his negative manifestation, the anima is, displays in undesirable qualities. <clears throat> she shows herself in moodiness, sulkiness, pettiness, and in her capacity to poison the man and everyone else around her by creating bad effect. Why is he talking about her? The anima is her in a man. Because it's the feminine side. Yes, it's the feminine side. Good, Kim. Negatively, the anima in a man acts for all the world like an inferior, peevish, oversensitive woman. Oh my gosh, have you ever seen a man act like that? Has anyone ever seen a man act like that? All of these ladies are nodding their head. Have you, uh, have, uh, Bang, have you ever seen a guy act like that? Sulky, moody? Yeah. See, what's really embarrassing is a woman can spot a man who's caught in a mood 50 paces away. It's like the guy who gets put down at work and he comes home at night and he opens the door and the wife looks at him and she immediately knows he's been wounded. And so he usually says something like, what's for dinner? This is stereotypical. And she goes, meatloaf. And he goes, oh, not meatloaf again. And suddenly, see, what's happened is his inner feelings have been wounded. And he doesn't know it and he won't own it. If he'd just come in and say, you know, I'm so angry. Or I'm so sick of this job. And it's not you. It's me. And i got to go put on my jogging clothes, take a walk around the block, kind of get myself together because I'm not ready to relate to anybody right now. I see, there's a very mature, conscious person who's not going to come uh, take his woundedness out on other people. And uh, or, or the, uh, the the CEO or some person at the corporate level, you know, he's had a fight that day, or he's uh, maybe his best friend has cancer, but he's got to be tough and hold those feelings in, or maybe his grandfather, the only person who ever was close to him, is dying or died, or he's had some conflict with his kids or some personal, and he comes to work. And he's not willing to tell somebody that, you know, I'm going through a hard time. And so what does he do? He snaps at people. And he's kind of like a little peevish, sensitive to a woman. And, and everybody knows it. Primarily the women around will know, uh-oh, what's up here? Uh, by the way, I always heard when I, somebody said, when I go out to eat, I never eat meatloaf because I don't know what's in it. But I also never eat it at home because I do know what's in it. <laughs> Well, that's sort of a... <laughs> I thought that was pretty cute. I heard nothing from Cinco. Maybe they fell asleep. We're awake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're awake. Keep going. Okay, so uh, if she takes a man uh, over, we feel he is anima-possessed. Such a man falls into dark moods that make him unapproachable by others. He loses his objectivity. Uh, and all difficulties in emotionally toned relationships become greatly enlarged. Small hurts when magnified by the anima become huge personalistic issues, which she feels compelled to uh, avenge. The weapons of the anima are mood, emotionality, poisonous comments which she inflicts on those who have aroused her ire. Only if the man could get in touch with his feelings, his feminine side, in himself, in the proper place, which is inside, and give her the right attention. All goes well. But if the anima gets between a man and other people, there's the devil to pay. For she exaggerates all difficulties, falsifies situations, intensifies hurts, and turns relationships with members of the other sex either into dramatic love affairs that soon crash to the ground or dramatic witch hunts. Sounds like, you know, TV drama 101, doesn't it? You know, during the period of, um, I heard when uh, the Crusades were going on, which, what, 11th century, 12th century, as these uh, men were leaving their families to go off to fight the infidels, the Crusades, back to the Holy Lands, where they, you know, in the name of God and, you know, Jesus and the cross, they just went and killed, you know, this goes on all the time. 
uh, unfortunately. In the name of religion, we do a lot of things to destroy people. But uh, the uh, but Dewey is it supposed to be the age of enlightenment. I don't know the history of this, the, the time uh, coming out of the dark ages. And what happens with a woman, and some of y'all may notice this, a woman often when she's flustered emotionally, she'll get uh, some red streaks on her neck. And those are commonly called uh, the devil's pitchfork. And uh, uh, during this age of supposed enlightenment and spirituality, going to go kill all the infidels, uh, women who their emotions would fluster here, that mark was considered a witch. There were over four million women killed during a period of about 15 years in Europe. And so women started wearing these, what we call Victorian collars. So nobody could see their subtle body uh, expression of their feelings. Have you, have you ladies ever seen that happen to yourself or someone? Uh, as a therapist, often as I'm talking to someone, I can often just see that on their necks. And, and I know something psychically important has just been touched or come up. See? But isn't that is interesting? Men go killing the witch. Because the woman may be saying, you're going to go off for two years? We have six kids? See, all in the name of God and the royalty and whatever, this great... Uh, what about these kids? Woman, mind your house. You know? And she's got feelings that are there. So often... Uh, when a man gets caught up in his moodiness and his feelings and not in touch with them, we can tend to do very irrational things. Um, and whenever you're watching this, I'm sure if you read the paper, you can see men who get caught up in moods who do very irrational, destructive things, all because they can't handle guilt, loneliness, fear, uh, hurt, depression, anxiety, failure, these common human experiences that a true man, a whole man, somehow finds a way to integrate theirs, those into his life. So, um, I'll, we'll come back to this in just a second. So, we might say, for the... Uh, well, in fact, here's a good... Uh, so, so, when a man is, is falling in love with a woman... And she's carrying his positive anima. She's the queen. Have you seen this, Will? <laughs> and, of course, uh, she's, she's animated his soul and he's very alive. And, then, of course, once he marries her or spends time with her over time, then suddenly that woman who carried all his wonder turns into the old hag. <laughs> and this can be true for men, too. See, this, this, this little thing here says before marriage. See, all, everything's sweetness and light because all these positive aspects have been animated. And then, of course, after you get married to somebody for a while, you just suddenly discover, oh, my gosh, they got as many problems as I do, or worse. See, because what happens is you find you only get to pick human beings to marry. There are no gods and goddesses. Now, I don't have one of these for men, a man, but... I would love for somebody to draw me one and send it over. And put it back on here, if you will. I want to show you something. The fact is, there is this difficult, struggling person inside of all of us. And there is this beautiful, gifted, talented, creative person inside of all of us. And, that, and the whole person knows that. And doesn't get too inflated with the princess. <laughs> And doesn't uh, and begins to try to manage the witch within. And to the degree we don't manage these things inside our own psyche, we will project them out. And we don't treat each other like persons. We treat each other like witches or angels because we haven't integrated these in our own life. And we say, oh, I want to get rid of all the people that have problems. I just want my life to be ecstasy. See? Well, when we do that, we're living in fantasy. And uh, we end up creating lots of uh, lots of destructive things. So, to, to uh, so the positive aspects of the anima would be gives relatability. Uh, 
creates and honors feelings creates and honors feelings and fosters understanding and soul which looks for deeper meaning in life. So that'd be the positive anima in men. You with me? Yes. Okay. Who, who's, who do you know? Who's a public figure that sort of, or a TV figure, or a role uh, that of a man who has a good, strong anima relatedness? Can you think of anybody? Who? How public? Well, it could be anybody. Who's somebody? Uh, I tell you, uh, uh, Alan Alda, this was 10 or 20 years ago. The guy on MASH was considered a real feeling kind of guy. It was put as a model. You know, it's a guy who can talk about his feelings. In fact, most of the characters on TV now, male characters, tend to be very sensitive. You don't see those old macho John Wayne, Kirk Douglas, Burt Lancaster types. We'll look at some of that as we look at... Uh, the men's movement and stuff. Who are we going to say? Gerald Vanderkamp. Who's Gerald Vanderkamp? He's the coordinator of the Gardens of Monet in Giverny, France. Oh, wow. Wow. And okay. um, actually, he, he used to, he actually had like a brief affair with Pamela. Uh -huh. Was it the one that headed a lot of the Clinton Gore um, campaigns? And, I mean, he, if you ever spoke with him, he was very feminine in the way that he spoke, but yet... Very masculine in his demeanor right. and attitude, okay. And he's very successful, very public. Yeah, yeah, and, and part of what I'm wanting to say is, uh, you know, ladies, do you, do you want to marry some guy and spend your life with some guy who's not in touch with his positive animus? Granted, none of us, oh, we all are at certain levels. But over time, now let's look at the, let me use this, sorry, Ant. Uh, the negative animus, anima, uh, let me give you several things of that. The negative anima, when a man's not properly related to his inner world, and it could come from, you know, a destructive home, from wounding, from, you know, all this stuff comes out of woundedness in life. Uh, it, it, the negative animus creates moodiness and let me say this all men have all of this <laughs> it's like it's not like we move from one side to the other never to go back in fact if you have an alive person uh, you're going to have the i just want you to acknowledge these because remember the anima are these are archetypal energies that are autonomous and they are uh unconscious they come upon us they come upon us because we're not listening to our feelings and then loss of logic and reason you ever, ever been around a man who suddenly is doing things that just he seems really out of character because he's not making sense it's like what are you doing you know you're gonna do what burn the house down to get rid of the rats I'm so damn mad about that I'm sick of it God see this anger has got a hold of him there's his his uh his, uh, like that animation, huh? his, his uh, feelings have taken over and now he's not even thinking properly. See? And the goal is to use those feelings, that anger, but use it for assertiveness to make a difference, not to leave the world of logic and reason. Because then you do things that can be destructive. But what we end up doing is we end up having men who are out of touch with their anima and they have no emotion, no passion, no feeling for life. They're just doing everything logical, flat affect, you know, I'm just doing the logical thing, and they have no soul. They have no, they're not connected. They're not very alive. And in, in, in many ways, this is the great patriarchal system of which women are trying to emerge up in and say, don't you have any feeling that I'm a person and I have a right to participate and be paid equally? Uh -huh. And then the other thing, the negative anima in a man kills communication. 
Cool. Any questions? You got that? Um, well, and let me just throw this out too because y'all have this too. Remember this sheet? Zoom in just a little there, uh, Huang. Huh? You remember this sheet? How did you score? Yes. Shauna, Amy? Okay. And you see there I have positive anima is tenderness, patience, consideration, kindness, compassion. And negative is vanity, moodiness, bitchiness, easily hurt feelings. So see, then you can you add all of that to there. And you got a lot of that to kind of honor what that is about. And I think on the test, I do, I have a question. I want you to give me three aspects positive of the anima, three as negative aspects of the anima. And so you've got a lot, uh, plus those other lists I gave you, plus that article I gave you. Okay? So, um, let me see if I want to do that. So a man does great work in life when he dares to uh, connect with his unconscious and find out what, uh, what is going on in his inner world. For everything he does not connect with and find meaning on his inner world, he will project out on, his, on others. And uh, you have to be aware of that, particularly in your own life. That's what I'm trying to encourage. Um, there, there's a deal here I just want to read that uh, Jung wrote that was pretty meaningful. If I have it. Oh, yeah. Just let me listen. Let me read this to you as we as we leave the animus, the anima thing. Uh, unintegrated in middle years, a man who loves who loses touch with his anima, his soulfulness, ends up diminishing with a diminution of vitality. Think about how, how many men in this culture, men that you know, who lose their vitality. They have no sparkle in their eyes, no sense of wonder. Don't know how to play with children or see the beauty of life around them, the sights, the sounds, the smells. See the, 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 and marvel at the wonder of people who are coming up and developing and the generativity give back. But uh, Jung says, uh, uh, a man who loses touch with his soul, his feminine side means a diminution of vitality, of flexibility, and of human kindness. And this results in premature rigidity, crustiness, stereotyping, and again, I'm not trying to stereotype uh, men by saying this, but you know, this, is, this happens to all of us, or it's possible. We have fanatical one-sidedness. It's a man who loses touch with his inner world and feminine over time. Obstancy, pedantry, or else resignation, weariness, sloppiness, irresponsibility, and finally, a child, childish petulance with a tendency towards alcohol. And, and you, see, you see these men who, they've just, and alcohol becomes a whiskey lady that a man will suck on and, and kind of nurture his woundedness. You see that in groups and 12-step groups, you know, you see this. And I'm not saying they, it's all of us. Uh, if we don't get in, do the difficult but important work of being in touch with our feelings, men. And, and let me say one more thing. The greatest aid to helping a man deal with his feelings is a woman who can help him deal with his feelings. Whether it's your brother, your lover, you know, your friend or someone. When someone says, gosh, I'm really sad. And if you hit him on the back, ladies, and say, well, get over it. See, what you do, he's just revealed his feelings and say, gosh, I'm so sorry. Do you want to talk about it? And so many women have a power to help men come forth and talk about their inner world without judgment, without criticism, and honor a man's ability to do that. But some guy does something sensitive or he risks doing some uh, act of uh, love or compassion. And because the woman doesn't trust it or feel seduced by it or her negative animus has kicked in, then she'll say, yeah, Bubba, you're not getting away with me or something. And she shuts him down and he closes off and he goes, well, I'm not doing that again. And a large degree of what affects a man's relationship with his anima is his relationship with his mother and the other women in his life. 
And if he has a mother who's really connected to her feminine and the soul and beauty and spirituality and meaning and nature, and it's okay to be a human and a fallible person in process, then he's lucky because he'll have that attitude towards his inner world. If he's got a demanding, critical, pushy, cold, you know, mother who, who's out of touch with his, her feelings, then often he, he, he doesn't know what to do with his soft world. See what I'm saying? So the point is we're, we all need one another to grow and to develop. And uh, my hope for this class, understanding gender, is that I can have a difference on the world on how I treat the men, the women, the boys, the girls, the people I encounter on a daily basis See, by honoring their world and honoring the, who they are. And uh, my hope is that everybody that takes this course will walk away seeing people a little differently. A little differently. Okay. Uh, any questions on that, Shauna or Amy? Does that, some of that make sense? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Can you relate it to some things in your own world? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I know, uh, you know, we could do a whole course on this, basically. There's so much here, and I have taught courses on it. Um, but it's just something to think about and, and look at because these unconscious... Uh, in fact, uh, zoom in here, if you will. See, this gives a class. There you go. Stop right. Very good. Nice job. See, so here's the woman's ego and her animus within, and she projects it out onto a man's ego. In other words, a woman are often... Uh, uh, let me, I've just done the other way. A man, uh, his anima, his own feminine side, he may have feelings of his emotional side. He may not be in touch with it. So what he'll do is he'll project it out onto a woman's ego. See? And he may be saying, I love you, but he's really saying, is I love what you awaken within me. I love what you awaken in me. And see, and then when she doesn't awaken it, often we say, gosh, well, we go through tremendous heartbreak. That's what we is all about. Because we've actually projected our soul onto another. Um, and that, that's the gift of romantic love, is through the woundedness at all, you can get in touch with your soul and find that you've got to have a, a, some kind of spiritual connectedness with your inner world. Okay, um, now let's look at the animus which is spirit, and it's the a masculine side of the woman's psyche. And animus is, uh, it's actually, uh, animus gives a woman, uh, it's on that paper I just read, which I can't find here, but uh, it gives, a, the animus actually gives a woman, uh, gives strength of character. A great movie of a woman who's developed a positive animus with her innate feminine is Chocolat. Has anybody seen that? Chocolat. What movie? Chocol is it Chocolat? Chocolat with uh, Juliette Binoche. Great. Pig. I've, I've, yes, yeah, Johnny Depp. I've seen the movie five times. It's just fascinating character of this woman because uh, she's full of tolerance, understanding, and grace, and beauty, and wonder, and love, and yet she doesn't take any stuff off anybody. So you see her strength of character in the movie. You know what I'm talking about, Kim? Have you seen that? Has some of you, the rest of y'all seen that? That's a great movie to go see or go rent and uh, write a page and a half on it about this animus development in her. And, uh, and actually, the protagonist in the movie, the mayor of the town, he finally breaks down and gets in touch with his feelings because he's been resisting them because his wife left him and he's hurt. And so what does he do? He gets demanding and critical and fundamental and controlling of all other people because he, in fact, has been hurt at the depth of his soul. You remember that part, Kim? Yeah. H Amy and Sean, have y'all seen Chocolat? No. Oh, you guys, you, you go, I'd, uh, it'd be fun if you could see it before our class ends because I'd Love to get your reaction to uh, this. Uh, but she's a neat, interesting model. of. They really take that, and you see these different aspects. Okay, so the animus is, uh, is a woman's experience of her masculine. 
not and uh in that sense it's uh and it's influenced by other men and by culture and her father but embodies her sense of groundedness it's not to say that women aren't grounded it's just we're we're uh affirming that well we'll just say that the, uh, she integrates particularly in the second half of life her masculine side uh, is it integrates uh, embodies her capacity uh, for enlargement of personality and her abilities it embodies her ability to achieve, A-C-H-I-E, achieve goals. And there's lots been said on that, and a lot could be said. Uh, it... Uh, the, the animus in a woman gives her ability to act, to act on internal thoughts. Uh, Jean Rotha says, uh, and ideas with courage and determination. To ex and to express her, these ideas in the world creatively. Uh, you, all of you college students, uh, women, you know, it's, your, it's that animus that is, it is, uh, is helping you to get here and work and make some decisions and take some risks and to push on. Uh, and uh, the animus is, uh, the animus gives a woman, it gives a woman strength. Motivation, boldness, confidence, and tenacity to follow through. Can you read that? Gosh, my penmanship is terrible. Um, Question: yeah. Why are those considered masculine traits? I, am I well, was I born just with this huge animus? Because I'm thinking, can't men and women be both? Why are those tenacity, confidence, strength? Why are those identified with men? Well, we, we, we uh, that's that's a good question, Lulu. We we addressed it a few weeks ago, and you may not have been here, but it's it's a very fair question and a very important question, and. Uh, uh, we, we originally started out, my, we, we, because the literature supports that and stories support that, and we looked at the symbols of the phallic symbol of initiating, pushing forth. Uh, uh, we, we're trying to look at these characteristics that have been sort of traditionally put, uh, placed in masculine and feminine energies, as it were, uh, just using the symbolic world of pushing and thrusting forth, creating something. We talked about a seminar, a seminar where you... But childbirth is that. Do thrusting, what? pushing, expelling. Yes. Childbirth is that. Absolutely. It's an ejaculation. Anytime you push something out is ejaculation. Yeah, and uh, uh, yes, it is. That would say a great trait, a masculine trait. Uh, not, it would be identified with that same energy because, as you said, men and women have it. And we looked at the and also from the other the list I gave you of masculine and feminine, we looked at the feminine archetype of opening up and receiving life. And it's a way to try to honor both, not compete against either. And the, the container, the waiting, the holding something, the, uh, you know, if you push everything ahead forever and ever, if you always have to pull up the plant to see if it's growing, you kill it. So... But what if you wait and leave it alone? Well, obviously men wait and leave it alone. And, uh, but, you know, it's a way of trying to look at these traits. I'm not trying to say men, men and women have both. Why is it identified? Uh, 
the literatures, the stories, the symbols, art, history, you'll find these symbols over and over. So it's already out there. I'm not like I'm making it up or I'm not pushing for it uh, to try to create it. It's already there. Why does the woman say, here, I can't open this. Open it. I don't. Uh, well, I know. Okay, and, and uh, to answer your question more fully is uh, there are some women who have more of this animus energy. There are some men that have more anima energy. So if some guy is a softer male with more feminine characteristics, what do we say? He's not a man or he's not a boy? Well, some people do. And, uh, uh, or if somebody's homosexual, or some people say, well, this, this isn't a real man. This is less than or other than. And that uh, these stereotypes have been destructive for years and destroying people. Uh, so who would be a woman who would have a strong, besides Lulu, who has strong animus characteristic? Hillary Rodham Clinton. Yeah, yeah, uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton. And, and what a neat model she has been, see? And yet she's a woman of bold dignity and integrity. And uh, um, she's quite a lady. And I mean, a lot of people don't like her because they don't like her pushiness. But I say this woman must have integrity out the kazoo. All this makes me think of uh, the old James Brown song, It's a Man's World, yes. but it's nothing without a woman in it. Well, that's good. <laughs> you know, for these soulful people. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Um, well, and I can remember this in my, when, in my daughter when I was single parenting her and she was in high school. And uh, one of the things I said to her was, you know, uh, I want you to go take a self-defense course. And uh, just because, you know, you'll be home times, I won't be there and whatever, it just will lower my anxiety. I want you to go take a self-defense course. And, you know, this, I don't require much, but I do require that. So she and her girlfriend went and took the self-defense course, and then they took the advanced course in self-defense. And uh, if uh, and so I'd go, this, this was before she was driving, and I said, I just want you to have this before you, you know, get your car and all that. She paid half, I paid half, got this little $3,000 car. And so, uh, but, you know, the, the, in the self-defense, has anybody taken a self-defense course, any of the ladies here? Have you had one? No. Well, one of the things the, the instructor would do, who was a kind of karate champion, is pretty, you know, a mean looking guy, but he was just very tender and sweet and fun. But he'd be all padded up, you know, and he would come at the woman like, you know, he was going to attack them. And their job is to turn and knew where to kick him in the groin and how to kick him away and, you know, to defend herself. And of course, he told me that Lori had one of the best kicks in his class. And um, the. Um, and so she took the advanced course, and, uh, uh, and what he tried to do is he said, I don't want to scare you to bring fear. What I'm going to do is try to make you laugh, because I want you to do is to concentrate on the task at hand, and that's to get the person who's attacking you to get away from them and protect yourself. If you give in to your fear, you're going to stop thinking. Now, in our language metaphor we're using here, this is good animus developed for a woman. You don't let your fear take over. You stay true to what you need to do, you know, to think, to stay alive, to get out of this. And, but he said, so I'm not going to try to scare you, but I'm going to try to make you laugh. And if you laugh, I win. So he goes, you know, he goes attacking them and all this stuff, and he does this stuff, try to get them to laugh. Anyway, so she finished the course. It was about a month later or so, and she'd gotten her license. She was 15 and a half or so, and she says, Dad, I want to go up to Austin to see a girlfriend for the weekend. And I went, oh, wait, I'm not ready for this. It's a little too soon. You're not old enough. That, Dad, look, I mean, I can take care of myself. I'll leave on Saturday. I'll call you when I get there. I'll call you before I leave. I'll call you when I get back on Sunday, you know. Dad, you got to let me go sooner or later, you know. Very wise uh, teenager. Knew all the buttons to push. And so I finally said, okay. And I said, but look, I'm just kind of scared. I mean, what if somebody, like, attacks you or something? She goes, right, Dad. On the freeway, people pull you over and attack you all the time. <laughs> now, see what's happening to me. My negative anima, my fears and emotions, and it's not all bad. It's just human. I'm going, oh, my gosh, my baby girl. What's going to happen? She says, Dad, you know, if something happens, I'll pull into a filling station or something and get some help. <laughs> and she says, Dad, <coughs> don't worry. I can take a man's eyes out. <coughs> and I said, okay, no curfew. <coughs> Hold on.
have some unresolved issues with your dog. <coughs> what? <coughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, I'm back to the land of the living. Thank you. <coughs> Quick thinking. I just got choked up. <coughs> and uh, John aptly said, gee, I wonder what that was about. <coughs> Talking too fast. Uh, so, <coughs> the point is, is to um, honor developing this inner strength of character in a woman as she develops. <coughs> For in developing this, a woman, a girl, will find the ability to follow through on her plans, her schemes, her dreams, her ideas in life. Okay, so let me give you some positive and negative things as I get my voice back here. <clears throat> positive animus. Hold on. Okay, we're back. We're back. <clears throat> God, I'm glad that's over. You know, they say sooner or later this is going to happen when you go on TV. Okay, the positive animus we will look at um, gives a woman empowerment. Did I blow y'all's ears out there in uh, Cinco land? No. <laughs> Thanks for pulling for me. I knew I'd be back sooner or later. <clears throat> Gives a woman ability to fight. For what she wants. And it gives her assertion of the life force. This is again from Jean Rafa from her book called uh, Journey to Wholeness. And see, doesn't, doesn't everybody need that? Now, the negative animus, well, in fact, l let me. Uh, let me just show you something right here. If these, if this is positive anima, we'd say these are natural traits in women, Lulu, easily. I mean, the natural traits in women is relatedness and feelings, understanding. Women are, seem to be more soulful than men. <clears throat> and when a woman naturally has this and she adds that to it, ability to take care of herself, make decisions, fight for what she wants, assertion, assert herself in life, we have a whole person. If a woman has all this ability to relate but can't assert, we have half a person. If we have a woman who can assert but can't relate, we have half a person. So what good is if you're, if you're right but you have no love and no relatedness? If you just say, I want what I want when I want and I get it, I don't care what it costs, you're going to end up alone in life. See? So it's, am I off the air? Okay. Make sure the light was on. Okay. Uh, so, in the negative aspects of the animus is uh, the negative aspects the animus erodes will, not will, not our student will, but our will, <clears throat> and erodes self-confidence, <clears throat> and erodes self-belief. You know, the parent who overindulges a little princess and doesn't ever let her go take risks and learn things is eroding and wounding her animus. Not letting her make decisions, not letting her think for herself. 
<coughs> oh, little honey, let daddy take care of that. Oh, you're not old enough. You're not capable. You're just a girl. Is just destroying and wounding that animus, that natural spirit, strength of character within. Uh, see, so the same could be true if we'd say, and again, this is all risky stuff, but we're using it for pedagogical purposes. Uh, so if we, we'd say the nat animus positive masculine, say, is a man, and there's the warrior, empowerment, fighting, asserting, seeking, assertion of life, and you take a man who naturally tends to have that, and I know these are huge generalities and can be stereotyped, but you add to that man the ability to relate and honor feelings in himself and others and to have foster understanding for the betterment of the world and people around him. You have a whole man. If you have a man who's just connected with his feelings, but he doesn't assert himself, you have half a man. If you have a man who's all into power and pushing things through, but can't relate, you have half a man. You see what I'm saying, kind of? Okay. And then again, to add this to it, uh, here's the, some more. The positive animus for a woman would be assertiveness, control, rational thought, strong, strength, and compassion. And the negative animus is when a woman gets opinionated, has to have the last word. Does that ever happen to anybody in here? And remember, these are autonomous, uh, unconscious forces that just sweep upon us. And when we, in, in that little article I gave you, that two pages, when a woman is possessed by her negative animus, we say she's animus possessed. And that may last two minutes, two days, two weeks, two years, 20 years. Has to have the last words ruthless and destructive. Why is opinionated considered negative? <clears throat> well, you tell me. No, oh, you asked the question. Opinionated in the sense of uh, not being willing to honor the yin and the yang. Opin uh, having an opinion is obviously positive. Opinionated has that sort of uh, extremism about it. Well, it's not that way. It's this way, and that's the way it's going to be. See, uh, can often kill communication. You know, um, I used to play tennis a lot, and uh, I, the, the fun of tennis is is playing and volleying back and forth. I go out and play tennis with this one guy, which I didn't a lot. All he wanted to do was just win every point. And it was like it was no fun because it was like, yeah, I got you. And, you know, the game went over. And then I, you know, I, I had to start playing assertively, too, to just survive. And pretty soon it was so darn competitive, it wasn't even fun. I mean, great to have a great shot, but it was, everything was almost so extreme. It killed the volleying, the fun, and even the competition. You know, we quit because there was just too much competitive energy going on. Op opinionatedness can kind of be like that. Uh, opinionatedness that is closed-minded can be a very negative uh, experience. Okay, so I think, uh, does that kind of help or? Yes. Okay. And, and there may be another way to look at that. Uh, um, and let me, uh, let me just say this about the animus in... Uh, uh, for women, one of the ways uh, uh, it's good for to a woman, uh, Jean Rafa says, to establish uh, uh, the autonomous means to develop a positive aspect of the masculine principle <clears throat> and to appreciate in others, men and women. You cannot develop <clears throat> a positive autonomous feeling hostile and defensive toward men or masculinity. Or if you feel victimized, violated, bullied, betrayed, abused, threatened, or dominated by others, it's so hard to get in touch with your own sense of power. She says, I'll read it again. You cannot develop a positive, autonomous feelings. You cannot develop positive, autonomous feeling hostile, defensive toward men and masculinity. Or if you feel victimized, violated, bullied, betrayed, abused, threatened, and dominated by others, which are a whole lot of women and minorities in our culture. And one of the ways you develop it is slowly by slowly making decisions. You want some personal power and authority? Get some education. Show that you're committed tenaciously 
to learning and developing. See? <clears throat> Push yourself. You can put yourself in some situations where you have to stretch and grow and, and stand forth and uh, assert yourself. You know, if you walk toward the things that are difficult, you become more of a whole person. Go get a job that challenges you to stand on your own feet. Make a decision with family or relatives that makes your own way out there where you have to get out and make it by yourself. This is for anybody and you will begin to develop your own sense of independence. And that, that doesn't mean not to need other people. Of course we do. <clears throat> Having a positive, intimate relationship with one's animus is one of the chief antidotes toward healthy relationships with men and achieving true intimacy. <clears throat> one of the things she says here is uh, this uh, regarding negative aspects of the animus, just to read this, uh, put it on the tape because y'all can listen back to it. Uh, if you do not learn to think clearly, you will borrow ideas from others and become overly dogmatic and opinionated. If you are unable to make distinctions between important details, you may become picky about insignificant ones. You know, so many people are opinionated by ideas, but they've never read books, gone to seminars, they've never studied. Take five years to study about that and read about it, and take courses, and learn from people, and then be in the debate. But you see, often we're lazy and go, oh, I don't want to. I should have a right to do it now. Well, fine, but you haven't paid a price to grow and become and participate. <clears throat> she says another place, if you, cannot, you, if you cannot be assertive in a healthy way, you may become controlling and manipulative in an unhealthy way. The negative animus can make a woman overly critical, argumentative, aggressive, stubborn, and a know-it-all. And what she says here, an antidote, is, that rec is for women to recognize and accept the fact that you have, may have a repressed feminine side. And I know, Lulu, we've talked about it. You've discovered that. My God, there's feelings. It had to fight growing up, but there's feelings in here. And find your own ways to express your feelings and admit your own inner reality. It's real hard to do if you've been defeated and you have this sort of fighting side, men or women. And, and she said, finally, is find acceptable outlets <clears throat> for your masculine qualities in the external world. Things you can take on and risk and take charge of. And, uh, and of course, that's what's happening with the seeker and the warrior moving and women's energies toward jobs and stuff. Um, the, if you do that, the negative animus will stop being destructive. Let me just, we just have a couple of minutes left. Let me just kind of show you this right quick. Ooh, lost that. <clears throat> you could be a man who, uh, watch this, has a strong masculine and an undeveloped feminine. Or an undeveloped masculine and a strong feminine anima. See that? This would be your macho person. This might be the soft, uh, passive, unassertive male. Could be a poet, but never publishes. <laughs> And then the goal would be to develop both. In a woman, God, this is all so fast to go through this. A woman may have her strong feminine, being dependent, caring, caretaker, and not have developed her masculine very much. So she's going to look for a guy like this to marry. You do the, you know, I'll do the feeling, the thinking. Or she may uh, have an overdeveloped masculine, be kind of pushy and not sensitive and caring. And, of course, uh, throughout life, if, as she grows and develops her feminine with her masculine, she becomes more of a whole person. And I think this is evolving in our culture. It's evolving in our own personal lives. And, if, you know, it's evolving all around us all the time. And, and part of why I wanted to present this uh, is for that. So on the test, I'll ask you about what romantic love is from we and what, uh, what is... Uh, what is romantic love, and what is human love, and uh, how does rom what is the negative aspects of romantic love, how did it get created, and then how does romantic love ultimately come back to serve the wholeness and serve the soul? And I have a question on that, which you can answer if you want to for the test. What? Okay, uh, we're off the air now. Bye. See you. Thank you.